All right. Um, my name is Glenn. I work at Microsoft. I work on the Windows Azure team. So it's great to be here. Great to be hanging out. I love this place. This is awesome. I will have to be. I'm, I'm already planning in my head how I can come back so I can come hang out. Um, so why am I here? Um, that's probably a good question. Why do I have a Mac? That's probably another good question. Um, a lot of things have changed uh, at Microsoft over the last couple of years, particularly around open source. And uh, I work on our cloud space. And in the cloud, we've really been caring a lot about open source because the cloud is really about bringing as many people as possible to run their workloads. And so fortunately, I think we realized that and said, hey, like if we're going to be really successful in the cloud, then this shouldn't just be about Windows. You should be able to run whatever stacks you want to because uh, allowing you to run those stacks just means you're going to use our product, right? Um, so, um, so that has actually caused a lot of really positive uh, changes happening around the company. Not only that, I mean, I think as a company, we've definitely also been generally becoming more accepting um, of open source. And, and part of that is really because we're driven also by our investors and our customers that are saying, hey, you know, I want to use your uh, MVC framework, but I want to use Backbone on the front end. I don't, I don't want to have to just use uh, ASP.NET Ajax, for example, or I want to use uh, NUnit as my testing framework. I don't want to use MS test if I was doing like .NET stuff. Or, hey, I want to run PHP, or I want to run, you know, Rails even, or I want to run Node. Um, so we've been doing a lot of cool stuff there. Um, and I've been very involved specifically with giving Azure more of an open source face. Um, so my team has worked on making sure that Node.js works well in Azure. We'll talk a bit about what Azure is, just to give you guys a bit of a context. Um, we build uh, client SDKs that allow you to consume some of the services that Azure provides from different stacks, uh, including PHP, Node, Python, uh, .NET, and there's others that are in the works. Um, and we also create a set of command line tools that can work both on Windows and on a Mac or Linux uh, for allowing you to leverage and manage your Windows Azure assets and to deploy to Azure. Um, and then recently, I've been pulled in on this cool effort we have at Microsoft called Azure Mobile Services, which also has a very big, I think, open source component in the idea that it's allowing you to say, hey, I can build iOS and Android front end applications that are backed by Windows Azure on the back end. Um, it actually uses Node on the back end. So I think one of the really interesting things about open source as well at Microsoft is we're no longer, we're not just making it so that you can use open source things. We're actually using them within our product. And Azure Mobile Services is a great example of where we're actually using Node to deliver a service of value to customers. So I think that's like a big change that has happened in the company over the last five years. In addition to other things like uh, in Visual Studio, we ship jQuery. Um, we've been embracing a lot of .NET open source as well within our products, which I've been pretty excited about. Um, so why I'm here today is uh, I want to tell you guys a bit about Azure. I wasn't originally focused just on that. I wanted to talk about mobile services and see what you guys think about you know building mobile apps using this. But um, it seems like there's a lot of misconceptions about kind of what, what work Microsoft is doing in this space. And, and you know, I, I hope to remove some of those misconceptions. So I figured we'd spend a bit of time just look at what the Azure experience is, what kind of things we're supporting, um, and we'll walk through that. I'll show you some of our command line tools and other stuff, and then we can move from there into things like looking at the mobile story. Um, asking questions, I mean, this is not formal, even though I may sound formal. I do a lot of presenting, so I may be sounding formal, but I'm not formal. I'm, I'm, I'm very informal. I'm actually too informal. Um, <laughs> Let's take the hat off. Cool and informal are, you know, cool and formal are two different things. Um, so how many, who here knows anything about Azure that doesn't work very tightly with Microsoft? Okay, what do you think it is? I think it's a simplistic version of .NET that you can run apps on. It has got queues and workflows and things. Okay, so that's a, a misconception, which I need to change. Um, so yes, you can run .NET on it. But at the high level, um, I like to describe Azure as two things. And this is, you know, if you were trying to compare Azure to other things that are out there in the market, Azure offers you compute 
a bunch of capabilities that allow you to take your workloads and move those to the cloud. And then we offer services. Um, services are add-on things that I could use in the cloud to make my applications more cloud ready, like make it easier for me to scale to the cloud because instead of depending on local things, I depend on a bunch of cloud services like for storage or for data or for messaging. Um, and then there's other things that we offer. Um, so it's really that delineation. Azure is basically a cloud hosting platform that offers you both compute and offers you both and, uh, services. So if you look at other cloud hosting providers out there, there's some that just offer compute. There's some that just offer services. There's some that offer both. We offer both. Um, and um, so compute is like, hey, I've got stuff I want to run in the cloud. It's my stuff. I want to run it in the cloud. And so for Azure, we offer multiple models of doing that. And I'm going to show you some of them. Uh, we offer, so when you look at, in general, cloud hosting, two terms that come up are IaaS and PaaS. Have you heard either of these? Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. Azure is both. It's really a hybrid. Um, so we have IaaS, which means I can create virtual machines. And IaaS is where I don't want to manage the physical hardware, but everything after that I'm managing, basically, if we go with the IaaS model. Right? That's like Amazon. You do like EC2. You can do some things like Chef and automated scripts and everything, but at the end of the day, that's your VM to worry about. You don't want anybody else doing things for you. If you want to have to, like, let's say you need to do some upgrades or patches to your operating system, you handle that. It's not going to automatically happen for you um, unless you run some type of automated solution. Um, so we support that. We support the ability now to even, uh, which a lot of people have found pretty surprising, you can actually deploy Linux virtual machines to Azure. So of course you can deploy Windows, that would be expected. But we have about five or six flavors of Linux uh, VMs. I'm going to show you that. Then you can SSH in. You don't, you don't have to use remote desktop to Windows if you're not <laughs> used to using Windows. Um, IaaS is really nice because it's the catch-all. It says you can run anything you want to in Azure. Because, hey, if it runs on Linux, it can run on a Linux VM. Um, then we have our platform as a service model, the, pl the PaaS model. And we have kind of two different approaches there. But at the end of the day, PaaS is about saying, hey, I'm deploying my application. And I'm not worrying about the image. I'm not managing the VM. I don't care about the VM. I care about give me a place that has enough power to run my app. And I want it to scale. I want to be able to scale it up. I want to be able to scale it down. Right? With virtual machines, when I'm scaling up, I'm actually creating more virtual machine instances that I have to manage. Whereas with PaaS, I get the ability to say, here's this app, and I've designed it in a way that it can scale, run 100 instances of it. And suddenly, I've got 100 times the processing power of what I had before. So that is the promise of PaaS. People like PaaS because I don't have to worry about OS updates. It's all done for me. Because I'm not attached to the operating system. I'm attached to the application. I may need some things from the OS. For example, if I'm running on Linux versus Windows, there are things like Dtrace, which is available in Linux, doesn't work in Windows. So there are some implications there. Um, but the, but the trade-off, the benefit, I would say, is that ability to have elasticity, to, to, not have, to have health monitoring. Like when, it, when you give us your application and we're in charge of deploying it, then we can monitor that. We can know if things go down, that we can take that down, and we can put it somewhere else. That's harder to do in, a, um, in an IaaS model. Um, and so we have a spectrum in our PaaS play um, of, you know, like if you're a startup and you just want to get going or you care a lot about really fast deployment, we have a model that allows you to deploy really, really quickly. You can use Git deploy. You can use FTP. Uh, we recently added Dropbox support. Uh, so you can basically say, hey, every time you go to this Dropbox, deploy it to the cloud. Um, and then we have, and, and that's really good for what we call websites, things where it's front end. Um, and you can deploy really, really fast and you can scale up. But sometimes you need to do back end middle tier things that are not really related to UI. Maybe you need custom drivers installed on the box. So we have a model which is kind of a hybrid between PaaS and IaaS. It's called cloud services and that allows me to I don't have to worry about the OS, it's deployed for me, but I get to actually go in the box if I want to. I can remote into it, I can run admin tools, I can do all these other things. So there's a, a spectrum there. I think at the end of the day, it's that Azure is trying to offer a lot of options. Depending on what your scenarios are, use the right thing. 
And then if I go on the services side, what kind of services do we offer? Well, one of the services we offer, so if you think about comparing it, say, to Amazon and EC2, you'll definitely see overlap there, right? Like, like Amazon has S3, okay, for storage. Azure has blob storage. Blob storage is a similar kind of thing. Unstructured data could be document, a document store. Um, the advantage of using a service like Blob in Azure is can be geo-redundant. So if I have a large enough organization and I have application or a large enough a user base where they're around the world, I can actually have geo-replicated data that is in Blob storage, which will propagate to, uh, say, the data center in Eastern Europe from the data center in West US. Um, so those services offer you a lot of scale. Uh, we have a table store, which is a very lightweight NoSQL store for just storing arbitrary data. We have a queuing mechanism, which is really useful for tiers communicating to one another where they don't know exactly about each other, but you just want to pop a message that this guy can get to do some processing. When he's done, he can pop a message back. Uh, we also have another messaging mechanism, a really broad pub sub. So that is not really about middle tier, but that's more like I want to put a message that thousands of clients might actually have to get. And I just want to broadcast, and it goes to all those people. So that's called Service Bus. Um, we also have uh, another really cool service that just recently launched called Media Services. And Media Services is the kind of technology that was used by the Olympics to do a lot of their video encoding. So we basically have video encoding and streaming as a service. So you could say, hey, I'm building an app. It doesn't even have to be hosted in Azure. So services are just available. You get a benefit of being co-located in the same data center from a performance perspective, but you can totally use all these services running even on-premise. Um, so with media services, you can say, hey, I've got videos that need to get encoded. I want to DRM them. Uh, I want them to support uh, smooth streaming, adaptive streaming, so depending on who the client is. And you can just upload that video, and it's a REST call, a HTTP call. It'll process that and make it available to other people. So, is that giving you kind of a picture of what Azure is? It's, it's a pretty broad thing. Um, and we're growing the amount of compute models and services that we offer. For example, Hadoop is a big thing now. A lot of people are looking at big data. We just recently brought, are bringing online a Hadoop cluster option in Azure that you could say, hey, I want to create a Hadoop cluster for doing Hadoop jobs. Um, and then we have Azure Mobile Services, which is also more of a it's a kind of a hybrid. It's a service, but it's also doing compute, which is to say, hey, I want to build a mobile backend, and I want a, that backend to be hosted in Azure. The front ends are mobile clients or browser clients. Yeah? Where are these uh, locations that you currently have? I mean, you mentioned US. And we have nine. I think we have nine or ten. The number's growing. We have data centers all over the world, okay. and we are the first... Um, we are the first official cloud provider to be sanctioned in China as well. So we are going into PRC. Um, we have a, a data center in Shanghai and a data center in Beijing. Um, that is going online, but that's because of the China situation. That, that's like a separate universe, but we do have Azure in China. But we are located in um, Singapore. We're in, uh, we have, we're in Europe, like Ireland, Eastern Europe. Uh, I think we're in Western, uh, Northern Europe. Eastern Europe, um, we are in uh, several in the U.S. We have we have the West, we have East. We're all over the place, and we're growing. So yeah, we have um, I think nine or ten data centers around the world for Azure, and it's up to you to choose which ones you want to use. Another service we have is CDN. So you can say, hey, I'm I've got a lot of content that I need to ser serve. It's static content. But I want it to be replicated around the world. I want it to be very fast. I don't want it to hit my servers. You can actually turn on the CDN service. So, um, yeah, there's 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 a, there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing, and, and that is growing. Um, and if you take to access Azure, we have this uh, HTML5 portal. And what's nice about it, you can even access it from an iPad. A lot of people like our portal, so that's why I'm going to show it to you, so you can get a sense of what it is. Um, so you can see here on the left, these are all the different kinds of services I can have in Azure. So you can see I have websites. That's our PaaS model. I have virtual machines. That's our IaaS model. I was just telling you about mobile services, which we're going to see today. As a matter of fact, I'll let me delete this.
it's a pretty nice responsive UI here. Let's delete that. Um, cloud services. We have Azure SQL Database, so you can deploy, uh, you can utilize a SQL database in the cloud. The storage services I mentioned. We have virtual networking, so this is an important one. Um, you know, we really care about hybrid situations where customers are saying, hey, I may want to move some of my workloads to the cloud, but I also have stuff that runs. This is really appealing for enterprises. Um, or I have data that is privacy concerns. I don't want to put that data actually in the cloud, but I need it to be accessible from the cloud. So you can create a private tunnel, basically like a virtual, uh, virtual uh, private network where you connect your routers actually to the cloud and you say that these are able to see each other just as if they're on the same physical network. Um, and then we have another technology which is really cool called Service Bus, which I was telling you about it does pub sub, but it has another really cool technology called the Relay. And what the Service Bus Relay allows me to do is say, I've got like these legacy services that are running, or I've got services that are running um, in my private network, in my corporate network, that I want to make just those services available through the cloud. And it's like a tunnel over HTTP, but it's not, uh, it's not a VPN. It doesn't require configuring routers. It's a very pointed connection where you say, hey, I just want to expose these three things so that this web app can talk to them. Um, it's, it's, again, I think for a lot of enterprises, they get a lot of concerns around privacy. Um, so that's, that's been a big deal. Um, the other thing we've got, uh, which I think will be interesting for you guys, is we recently added a store. So you guys have said you're familiar with like Heroku. So we've got this store, and we've got things like Pusher in there. Um, a big one that people have asked for is this one. So you can run MongoDB hosted within Windows Azure. Um, so it's not something that's external. It actually is a service that the Mongo guys run. Uh, we have things like New Relic for monitoring. Pusher and PubNub for doing messaging. And this is growing. And this is all about a third-party play. Like, you know, third parties that have products and they want to offer those as services in Azure, they can plug them in as add-ons. Um, if you have ones that you think should be here, we have MySQL. You say they're in Azure. Are they running, like, on Azure? A lot of them, like, Mongo's running on our IaaS. But they run it. The point is it's not something that you have to worry about. Yeah. You say... I want a MongoDB instance, you get a MongoDB instance, but you don't have to worry about the maintenance side. Whereas, if you were to use something like IaaS and create your own Mongo instance, then you're actually making sure that thing is up and running. You've got to know that, oh, I have a single box. Whereas here, it's like, hey, I want a place to have my data. If I want to move the slider and say I want something bigger, I just do it. It's there. It's managed for me. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Any questions on this stuff? I maybe got a little, maybe went a little overboard, but I just figured I'd give you guys the tour. Questions? Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, other things like, let's say I have a website that's deployed, uh, and we'll 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 get into showing that. I'll I'll show one in a bit. Um, but you actually get some nice, tool, some, some nice uh, ability to see what's going on. Like we give you metrics on traffic. Um, I can look at the deployments, which we'll, we'll get into what deployments mean. Um, I, can, I can turn on different types of monitoring. I can scale up. I can go right here and say, OK, I have a single instance of my app. Now I want to scale that up, scale up the number of instances. I can move from the free model, so we give you 10 free websites. So if you're like a startup, you're just trying to get going. And actually, it's more than 10. It's 10 per data center. So you actually can have like 100 free sites. Now, free sites have a constraint on them in terms of the amount of traffic they can get. So it's great for prototyping. It's great for a small startup that doesn't know if it's going to catch. It's still a decent amount. Once it gets to the point where it's big enough, then you can move either to shared, which gives you your own domain name, and you can uh, increase the bandwidth, but you can go all the way to reserved. And with reserved, it's like you're saying, hey, I want a dedicated VM for running my stuff. Um, it's still managed for me, but then I can, you know, flick these numbers here for the number of instances of my app that are running in my pool. It's like I almost have my own pool of, 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 of VMs that I'm running. So um, that's the website's experience. So let's get going and let's see about the command line and see how to actually deploy something. We'll, we'll do a node app. Sorry, what, that, that web tool, what is that actually built on? Is it 
Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember. I think they may be using Knockout. I'm not sure. Um, and I think they're def I think they're using jQuery stuff as well. But but I'm not. Yeah. I mean, we could we could actually just view source. It looks beautiful. Yeah, we've we've put a lot of work in, and and a lot of people have even gone so far as to say like I love Amazon in terms of capability, but the portal experience. We really I think we did a really good job. But it, it's great to hear you guys say that. Um, and it's not what we had before. We used to have Silverlight, which you know was blocking for a lot of people. Like this, you literally can go into your iPad and go to this and manage your websites and stuff right from uh, right from a tablet. Um, so, yeah. Yep, there's jQuery UI. Definitely that's there. I don't know if it's if knockout is there. Let's see. Yep, knockout. jQuery and knockout. There you go. So the guy who wrote knockout actually works on my team, um, which is which is part of probably why they chose uh, why they chose knockout. Um, does it seem usable? It looks I mean it looks fantastic. All right, cool. So you guys can sign up. There's trials. So Azure has a free trial. Uh, which is 90 days, but the websites and the mobile stuff you can actually get perpetually free for 10, as I mentioned. Um, so you guys can definitely play with this stuff uh, without paying for it. And then if you decide to go further, you can, you can pay for it. We have a pricing calculator too where you can see what all the prices are. For, for VMs, if you just want to go with IaaS, um, it's like $9, $9 a month, I think, for the smallest instance. Um, so you could run a Linux VM or a Windows VM for that much. Uh, and then it, it goes up from there. Like we've made the extra small really cheap to make it as attractive as possible. Once you go up from there, it, it, starts, to, it starts to jump up. Um, so let's go do a Node app. So, one of the, so what we'll do is, um, you guys are all familiar with Node, right? Yeah. I'll just do the Canonical Express app because it will show a few things. So I'm going to, uh, I've already got Express installed, so I don't need to do anything there. So I'm just going to run the scaffolding tool because all I want to do is show you deploying an Express app. Now, um, you know, one of the things Node has, as I'm sure you know, is NPM modules. Um, so we support when you create Azure websites, actually having those modules download on the fly on the server. So you don't have to actually push those modules into your code base, um, which is convenient. And we have this command line tool that you can get by doing npm install azure-g, which is our Azure command line tool for cross-platform. Um, we also have PowerShell tools uh, for Windows um, that do similar things. So I already have that installed. So if I type Azure, you'll see something like for you Jitsu fans, it'll look kind of a little familiar. So we use Winston and you know we pulled in our own ANSI art. As Charlie Robbins likes to say to me, he says, imitation is a form of flattery, the highest form of flattery. Um, and one of the things I think that's really cool here, though, highlighting in terms of the open source side of things, that when we build this stuff, so I mentioned how we use Winston and we use Request, you know, this is different than the way we've done things in the past. We used to write everything. Now we're actually saying, hey, there's something out there that works, like Winston works great for a logger, uh, Commander works great for processing, Commands, Express works great as a web framework. Let's just use that stuff. Um, so that's, that's a real different thing, I think, of the way that Microsoft is working now, which I think is, well, one, it just saves us a lot of time. We don't have to build everything ourselves. It also stops us from continually reinventing the wheel, which some of us are probably sad about. Um, so if you look here on this Azure thing, it has subcommands. It's a little bit different than Jitsu, if you've used Jitsu, because the focus of Jitsu, Jitsu, um, no, Jitsu is really about compute. They're not about the service side. Um, so they don't have to, and they don't have different models. It's one model, which is simple, which, is, which a lot of people would like. Um, Azure has lots of different services and lots of different models. So you can see here that I'll do Azure Site to manage my websites. I'll do Azure Mobile to manage my mobile services. Azure SQL, if I want to manage my SQL database, Azure SQL database instances, Azure VM, if I want to work with VMs. 
So I talked to you about VMs. Somebody said, I want to see what it's like to deploy a Rails VM. I think somebody said that. How do I deploy a Rails app? I haven't done Rails in a long time, and I've only dabbled with it. So somebody else has to write the app, but I will show you what it looks like to set up the VM. Um, so you can do Azure VM dash dash help, and you'll see that you have a bunch of things you can do here, like you can list your VMs. You can list your images. So the images show the available images that we have. Stock images. Ah, sorry. No, it's just this. So these are the stock images that we have. So you can see we have BizTalk server. We have a bunch of Windows ones. And then we have Ubuntu, SUSE. Um, we had CentOS. There it is. We have a CentOS one. Um, those are the major ones that we're supporting. And then we have like server 2012, which you would expect. Um, but we have more than this. So one of the cool things we did open source wise recently is we launched this thing called VM Depot. So those are the stock images that we include in the box that you can use and you can then SSH in and set up your own thing and you could save that to an image. But we've also got a bunch of partners that have stepped up because we created this thing called VM Depot. So this is all open source stuff. This is all third parties. Microsoft is not, as far as I know, we set this thing up. Microsoft OpenTech actually set this up. So actually, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair for me to talk about open source without mentioning MS OpenTech. We actually created a subsidiary completely around not just uh, embracing open source, but contributing actively to open source. So we are, so the node work that we did, we worked with Joyent to make Node work well on Windows. And we actually had a full-time employee that we always have hired who's working on the Node core team to make sure that works well. That is done under the MS OpenTech umbrella. Um, and we've done a bunch of other really cool stuff. Um, we've done some extensions to Node to make it work better on Windows, like things like Dtrace are not available, but there's uh, ETW. Um, so a lot of people want to use Dtrace with Node so they can get flame graphs. And we now built a tool that, based on putting these extensions in Node for Windows to support ETW, you can get those nice flame graphs, similar kind of things you get with Dtrace. But if I go here, I can look for, say, Ruby. And you will see that uh, Ruby has, a, that there's a bunch of things that Bitnami has done. They've done the Ruby stack Ubuntu image. So it's just an image that's preloaded with, you know, with Rails and other stuff. It's not stuff you couldn't do yourself. They've just pre-configured it. And, you know, Bitnami's pretty known. They did a lot of work also uh, with, with, with Amazon. What's cool about this, though, is our command line tool. So I can go here, and I can click this deployment script. And when I do, I can select the region where I want to deploy. So let's say I'm going to deploy to uh, East US. We're in East US. And it gives me this, this CLI command. So I can paste this in to my sh terminal shell and fill out the username and password. And basically, that will create for me that Ruby VM that I could then SSH into. So you guys want to see that? Sure. Let's see if we get a little bit. Um, Annoying about passwords. Let's try this. I'm never going to remember it, is the problem. Um, <laughs> so, somebody remember that. Capital C, or actually, let me make it easier for myself. Let's just do it like that. One caps. We, we, are, we have some anal rules about what you have to put in to be proper. Since CJ dollar sign password. I think that should work. Capital C. Oh. I think it was dash dash SSH for some reason. Yes, it is. It's now thinking that that's subscription. Good call. Okay, so this is now, so see what it's doing. So now it's not going to the standard image store. It's going to that community 
image store to get the, the Rails image. And are these instances of images, are these hosted on Edge? What you're going to get deployed now will be. Will be. The image yeah, store, I don't know if the image store is on Azure. Okay. It may be, probably is. Probably makes sense that it is. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's not. I don't know if it's actually hosted on Azure or not. But, that, that would, but, um, but the important thing is the virtual machine that's going to get created will be. So all this is doing is, and you can do this yourself. The difference is that this is a community portal that anybody can access. You can load your own images up. You can even put them in blob storage and get a URL and pass it to your friends. Yeah, right? You could create the Cincy Ruby stack image. So the user and password there, that's, that's the password that we'll use. The SSH. You can also use a certificate. That's not your like, Azure account. No. No, no, this is just my, this is just my, this is my login. Oh, that's why you were worried? No. This is creating the username and password that I will use to log in. Um, and we also do support certificates if you want to basically use certs. Um, uh, not certificates. I mean, we support, you can use SSH. Um, yeah. So this is, this is Linux. I mean, this is. It's a, it's a Ubuntu. It's a Ubuntu. This is Ubuntu. Okay, it's an so Ubuntu, Ubuntu VM. Ubuntu with Ruby set up, yeah. It's running slow, though. It shouldn't normally. I shouldn't take this long. It's Ruby, so it's huge. <laughs> yeah, it's copying the VM over. It's, it might take a few minutes. We'll, we'll come back to it. We'll let that go. I, I got um, a question while I was running. So yep. what, what would you say about like pricing versus like Amazon? Because I think of this, and I think maybe Amazon's like the closest thing would be sort of comparable in my mind, like is the pricing really... We've lowered, uh, so Amazon has spot instances, which is a pretty nice model. We don't have spot instance model. Um, we are um, comparable mm -hmm. um, outside of the spot instances. I mean, we actually lowered our pricing to be more... Right. But, um, yeah, I'm not the expert on the pricing. I don't want to say anything to get myself in trouble. Right. But I think it's comparative. Right. That's what I've heard. Um, you know, it's not always apples to apples, too. You have to look at everything the service right. has to offer. Right. Um, that, that's but, actually where it gets tricky. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. not a direct apples to apples. Yeah, it's not apples to apples. But it's in the realm. It's not a, you know, it's in the realm. All right, so let's let that finish. I don't know why it's, it's taking longer than usual. Um, when you create a new, fresh one, it actually is probably, it's faster. Um, and, and that may also be because of where it's copying the image out yeah. from. Yeah. So, all right. So let's do the website thing while that's happening. So we went to, um, wait, where was that app I created? Was in, uh, was it CINCJS? Where did I? So when you say website, is that meaning like an app? Yeah, so the difference there, I would say, when we think about website, is it's mainly a front end. Like it can be a no, it's a node, it can be a full blown node application, but it's usually uh, websites are usually for either like an API, something that is frontward facing. It's the best way to describe it. It could be a website that actually has UI. It could be just an API. It could be both. What it's not necessarily ideal for is something that is just pure back end. Some of our other models, like either using a VM or using cloud services, are more optimized for that. Um, you could run back-end solutions there, but it might not be, you won't get as much power probably as you want. It's, it's not the ideal use for it. You could. So it's geared towards front end. Like if you think about, um, like Heroku has dynos, right? And this concept of things that are more front end focused and back end focused. In Windows Azure, we have the same thing. So when you talk about cloud services, we have this concept of roles. We have a web role, which is really something that's more focused on UI and serving up web or maybe some API wrapper stuff. And then you have um, worker role. It's kind of equivalent to like the, the bat, you know, and I don't remember what it's called in Heroku, but you know, they, they have that other type of dyno, which is like a worker. Um, so websites is closer to a, a web role, which is closer to that frontward facing dyno. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I've got my Express app, and I'm not going to run it. You guys know what Express is. You know it works. What I am going to do, let's check on this and see what this is doing. Still copying. OK, that's taking a long time. OK. Sometimes things break during 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a website called CINCJS, and I'm going to enable Git deployment. Um, one of the things that's really nice about this, so Windows Azure websites support the ability to, um, you can use Git deployment. You can also use GitHub integration and do continuous deployment. So you can say, hey, I want to use GitHub. I have an open source project or I'm using, uh, I have a private repo on GitHub and I want to wire that up. I can do either or. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm just using the Git. This is kind of like what Heroku has. I'm just using the Git endpoint that is hanging off of my Windows Azure website. So it's private just for me. And usually I wouldn't work out of that. That really is a repo that's just there as a vehicle to get my code to be deployed. Um, one of the things that's nice what we do with our command line tool is if we, if we detect that you're a node app we, we, because we look for it, we automatically create a git ignore and we add node modules to it. We automatically, if you specify dash dash git, we automatically create a local git repo for you and add the remote. So we've done a bunch of stuff for you that you would normally have to do manually simply by putting that dash dash git. So if I do like uh, git remote dash v, you see that it's already turned this into a git repo, wired up the remote for me, and it's got that git ignore file there with node modules. So what I can do now is say git add, git commit. You can use npm shrink wrap. This supports shrink wrap. Yeah, that's been a big, huge debate, but this is the difference. So there's my Git repo. Um, there's a lot of debate on this, right? Like if you have a public GitHub repo, for example, should you put your modules or not? The, the, the place where I think a lot of the community has landed is that for apps, it is better to put your modules in. Um, shrink wrap helps because you can lock everything down, but with shrink wrap, there's still like what happens if like, NPM went down or something like that, like you're still dependent, but shrink wrap is at least a way to lock down all the dependencies from top to bottom. And we support shrink wrap because we just run NPM and if the shrink wrap file is there, it will work. But while you're doing rapid development, I think it's like, you know, and, and, and if you think about websites, you could easily have a staging website and a production website. And you might say on the staging website, I don't push my modules on the production website, I do. And you could easily do that. Um, so now I'm going to uh, push. So it's now pushed. I don't know if that's actually succeeding. I don't know though. That's no comment. <laughs> I'll create a new VM from scratch. I haven't actually done that one before. So I'll show you that creating a new one from scratch takes about two minutes. <laughs> Um, that, 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 that was not what I was expecting. So you just pushed it all and then packaged it. So now it is running NPM on the server. That's why you see remote there. So we give you the NPM output. It's now deployed. So now I can say Azure site browse. There's my website. And then I can go into, I'll close that off. Um, Or I can go into a sublime text and you know just make a so I can close that and then We allow you to do um, choose from a, a set of node versions. You can use package.json if you want to choose. We have a limited set that we support. We're growing that number, but you do have the ability to choose different versions. Um, one of the things that's nice is this command. Like we have this principle of we don't want you to have to copy around URLs. So conventionally, right from the directory, if you do Azure Site Browse, it opens up the app um, and put, uh, opens up the browser to that URL. Um, one of the other things we allow you to do, which is nice for the staging scenario, is you can set your environment variables. So from the command line, you can do this from the portal as well. 
you can do this uh, Azure Site config list. And so let's say I was deploying this same app to two different sites. One was staging, one was production. My database is going to be different for staging. Some other information may be different for staging. Uh, other types of settings around diagnostics, all of that. I can set these key values using this Azure Site config. Those propagate to the environment. If you're using Node or PHP or any other stack, they're just environment variables that I can access. Um, so I could do like this. I could say like Azure Site config. Um, add, you know, foo equals bar. Okay, so now I can say Azure Site config list. Okay, so now if I go into uh, Sublime again, let's see if it's still open. So I can go back here, and then I can say foo equals foo. Close it. I must have closed it. Might be minimized. It's horrible. OSX stuff. No, it's. I think it's closed. Oh. Yeah, it's closed. Okay. Well. Oh, I must have done something wrong. Yeah, where's foo defined? It, is, you want to like fetch it from the environment or something, right? Yeah, I set it. Didn't I set foo or did I set bar? Yeah, I did, and I set um, I set foo equals bar. You don't have to like fetch that from somewhere. Process. Oh, didn't I do process that or did? Oh, that was wrong. Yeah. Okay, so that got an error, and I can actually get the output of that error. Let me show you because we want to see what the error is. So what I can do is. Um, <laughs> no, it wasn't, but that's a good, it's a good segue. So what I can do is uh, we have this thing called IIS node YAML. It's a YAML file. You guys are Ruby guys, so you've got to love YAML. So I can, I can change this to lo yeah. logging <laughs> enabled true. Okay. So I'm going to just do this. I'm going to keep it, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to keep it broken because I'm going to show you what we allow you to do. So one thing we allow you to do actually is to stream the log output. So I can do Azure site log tail. And let's see, let's see first if it'll show it that way, too. So if you refresh your page, you'll probably see it. Oh, yeah. Did I close it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, too, I'm too comfortable with this Azure Site Browse. I love this feature. Uh, oh, no, it's not in there. Right? It's conventional, so i got to be in the folder. Since CJS. We like convention over configuration where, where we can. So that's probably just tails right there. Yeah, let's see if it is. Nope. So it's, it, it's breaking, and yeah, I'll need to look into that, why it's not getting it. But let's go commit, because then we'll see it show up. So git commit dash am updated yml. So we should see the error now. Oh, okay, we should not. All right, let's go back and fix the error. Yeah, I don't know why that's not working. It should be working. Let me try one thing though. It, it may be because it's already broken, and I may need to restart it. I don't let's just see if that does it.
So let's go back to fixing it. Uh, I'll figure out later why that's not working. True, true. So if you index data, uh, you did process Yeah, yeah. No, I need to fix that. I was trying to see though if it why it's not giving me the error. Yeah, it should be process.m.foo. .foo. Yeah. That should work. What is James? Uh, view engine. So like in Rails, you have different view engines. That's a view engine for Express. It's, it's like Hamel. It's kind of based on. Uh, I think it's the most beautiful I really like it. I, I don't. I, I totally. I totally love I'll Jade. Spark any I'm not controversy, but it is the greatest ever. <laughs> I didn't know any. Oh, do you know what a view engine is? I'm like there's ERB. What kind of uh, what kind of development do you do? Our, our front end's all XJS, it's all JavaScript. Oh, okay, cool. You can totally just change it if you want to. Yeah, Jake, you can compile compile anyway. All right, let's see if it works now. Come on. There we there go. It is. Okay. So I, that is weird that it didn't pick it up though. All right, so that. Does your log say anything? Um. Oh, where I was tailing? Oh, you quit tailing. Never mind. Yeah, I quit tailing. Um, but it didn't show on the tail. I'll, I'll, I'll have to go f figure that out. We might have a slight bug there. But it definitely works. Like if I put log entries, like if I run Express, for example, not in production mode, you'll see all that stuff streaming. So it definitely works. So what do you guys think Maybe. of the experience? Does it seem pretty easy? Yeah. Okay. Um, so like that environment variable thing is useful because now, again, I could deploy to a staging site and a production site and those settings can be different between them. Um, I can also use the store to say, hey, give me a MongoDB instance. And once I get that MongoDB instance, I could then put the connection information for the MongoDB instance into my environment variable settings through using that settings feature. Um, the other thing we have that's kind of nice, so let's say I added those, but this is, this is a cool uh, example of this, is you can do this thing called Azure Site Deployment List. Wow, I think that thing has just died. I don't think it's working. That has taken way too long. I wonder if it might have worked though. If I, I don't think it did because it would have, let's see. I don't think it worked because it would have had to have copied it to then create an image. Yeah. It didn't create it. Um, so what you can see here is these are all my commits. And so I have the ability to redeploy at any time. So let's say like I made a change and I broke something, like when I did the added foo. So I can take this here and I can say Azure Site Deployment Redeploy. And I can give it that number. And so that will roll my site back to the state that it was in. So I can, you know, if I, if I see I did something where I want to put labels in my messages and I need to bounce back to an earlier version of the site for whatever reason, I can do that. That might be useful in the staging environment. It's probably not, you know, or it, it's useful in production too. Like if you deployed and immediately you saw there was a bug, rather than waiting, you say, okay, let's just roll it back. You can roll it back quickly. Um, so I think, so that's actually pretty nice. And then you can go through any one of those. Um, other things we allow you to do is you can customize what runs on the server when you deploy. We have this thing called a deployment script. So one of the examples I do, which I won't do now because we've spent a lot of time on this, is uh, like let's say I want to run Mocha. I want to run Mocha unit tests at the time of deployment on the server. Like I want it to deploy and then I want to run those Mocha unit tests to make sure everything is working properly. Um, I can do that. I can customize that through the deployment script to do whatever I want. So, yeah. Uh, this works for PHP. It works for .NET. Um, we've added support now for Python. You can also do Python. And uh, there are other things that coming might be coming in the future. Um, so, probably not going to be able to do that Ruby demo that I wanted to do just because this is... I can try this one more time and see... It might have just died. I mean, it's an HTTP call. It might be that we have a bug. Um, wait, what did that do? I copied too much. 
Why does it let you do that? I guess it, well, I guess it can't stop you. Oh, wait a minute. Did I have Azure VM DNS prefix? Yeah. Oh. Oh, that was it. That might be why it failed. I missed that. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's call it Cincy. Yeah, I think I found a bug though. I think I'll now have to go reproduce that. I think what got what happened is it, it, it somehow got caught because of that. Let's see. It might have created the VM already. No, no, I think this should work. Let's see if it works. Interesting block will be overwritten. Oh. Currently a pending copy operation. Couldn't copy blob. Because you're, it's already attempting to copy the one to that. So I need to change the name? Yeah. Um, or is it still in the middle of doing the other one? That's weird. It's probably going to take a while for it to time out. I don't know what I can do at this point because this, this, I'd have to change it to a different image because this is the image name that it's copying from. All right, let's just move on. Not that interesting. Um, so any questions about this stuff? How does it feel? Are there any, you know, any things that you see and you're like, oh, I wish I could do this or anything that you would see would get in your way? I, don't know, I guess I'm still not sure if I understand the difference between like the website, which is more the the PaaS, and the and just deploying the images. I mean, for like a website, you can run your own backend on that, or is it really? Just so here's the big difference: code? website. I'm just sending code. I don't have access to the VM. I mean, can that code be? Does it have to be .NET? I mean, can it be Python? I mean, it can, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, so with, that, with, so with IaaS, you can do whatever you want because it's like I get a Linux VM or a Windows VM and I set that up. I go and I set up and install whatever I want to on there or I could use the image gallery. What this model is saying is, hey, you just give me a Node app or a Python app or a PHP app or a .NET app mm -hmm. and it will be up and running in the cloud. Okay. Heroku is kind of the same thing. Like when you use Heroku, you don't get access directly to the VMs, do you? No, no. not at all. And Nojitsu is the same thing. Right, so so that's the way to th that's the way to think about it. Okay. The the issue of the website versus anything else is just that it's really geared towards things that are frontward facing and serving stuff up. And why we think it's not good for backend stuff is like imagine you needed some native CDLL installed on the machine, for example, if it was Windows or some drivers. You needed to actually get to the machine so you can install drivers. You're not going to be able to do that in this model. You're gonna for that you need cloud services or you need a VM. Okay, that's clear. So you're combining like the Heroku model with the AWS model. Yeah, I mean, Asa, to be fair, Amazon has Elastic Beanstalk, right? Which is also kind of a PaaS model. Just not as many people talk about it, but it's there. They just open. They just released support for Node. And, and they just did Node for Beanstalk. I'm not sure how for how long, but they supposedly have support for .NET. I haven't tried it yet. They've had that a while. Okay. And they actually have really good support. Um, but uh, so th does that explain the differences between them? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. I get it. okay. The website is much the, the actual process of it. They're actually handling the request coming in yeah. is very very close to Heroku because yeah. it's a process that's spun up. Yeah, not a VM. It's using load balance, right? So it is a shared hosting model. Now I can get dedicated servers, but even if I get those dedicated servers, I can deploy multiple apps, and it's a it's a shared it's still a shared model. So with a, with a cloud service, it's like when I deploy that app, a new VM is spun up for me, and I'm paying for that. Whereas with this, I'm just getting a slice, and that's why we can offer you a free model because we can have a ton of people on the free tier running on the same VMs. It's in a sandbox. It's in an OS level sandbox, so there's no issue of like this one can see this one's data or anything like that, and it's all measured in terms of how much utilization they can use. But that's really the difference that it's a shared hosting model. I should start using that. But you know, with reserved, it kind of throws it off a bit, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so this, you want to take a five minute break, or do you want to keep going? Sure. How are we feeling so far? Good stuff? Or? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Water, I'm good. Talk. I can keep going. I'm just getting warmed up. All right. So I'm going to move off of websites and VMs, but if you go to um, windowsazure.com, another thing, if you like the portal, 
Um, we've been doing a lot of work on like really good documentation, really good content. Um, we've got a whole dedicated team to this, but like you can come here and you can say, hey, I want to do node stuff. And you've got all these different types of tutorials here, like using Socket.io, um, using MongoDB, uh, using SQL Azure, using some of those other services. I should mention that. So one of the things we have is we have a module called Azure. And you can find that on GitHub. Uh, our CLI is Azure SDK for Node. So if I go to github.com slash Windows Azure, yes, we're on GitHub. And this is all open source in terms of these libraries. And the command line tools are open source as well. So if I go to the Azure SDK for Node, um, you'll see that... Uh, like table storage, if you want to use that table store that I was describing, that little NoSQL store, or if you want to use blob storage and deal with documents or unstructured storage, um, you can just require this node module, get it from NPM, and then work with our Azure services from within node. And I know of a few people who've actually done this from Rackspace, who've said, hey, I want to use Azure. So you don't have to be running in Azure to use this module. You need to be using Azure services. You wouldn't use it otherwise, but you don't have to be running all your workloads in Azure. All right, moving on. So Azure Mobile Services. You know what? I will take a water for a second. <laughs> I have a Brita at home. Brita is awesome. <laughs> you learn something about the value of clean water when you're in China. I was in, I was living in Shanghai for three months this summer, uh, working with our uh, one of our teams over there, and you cannot drink the water there. You have, it is so horrible. You don't even brush your teeth with it. You'll get sick. Okay, I was gonna say. Shanghai is fine. Beijing. I went there. Beijing is pretty bad. All right. Have you guys seen Reveal JS before? Yeah, we use it for our. Uh, Reveal is just so awesome. We use it for our uh, presentation. presentation. So I'm yeah. going to show you one right now. We use Grunt and Node to serve them up. Really? Yep. Nice. What is Grunt about? I, I haven't used I, I, I Grunt is a build tool. Okay. As grunt.js, yeah. Yep, right there. Okay, so so I'm flipping hats now to talk about mobile apps, um, but it's not just about mobile apps because of the HTML5 support that I was mentioning earlier that I'll talk about. But it, it's really about um, allowing you to leverage the cloud to take care of a bunch of things for you that you probably don't want to take care of, but you have to today. So one of the targets here is really like we're looking at client-side developers. They don't have to just be mobile developers and saying, hey, if you're a client-side developer, if you've been writing code in JavaScript and now you want to move to the cloud, what does that look like? What are the things you have to deal with? Um, Node was attracting this, but Node was saying that you're a client-side developer and you can take those skills to learn how to be a server-side developer. But you will learn about the server. You will add to your knowledge, utilizing what you already know in JavaScript to learn about things like Express and Connect and all this other stuff. That's not what Azure Mobile Services is trying to do. Um, so you've got a lot of concerns that you have to worry about. One of the first ones is, where's your data going to live? If you're deploying to the cloud, you, and, you know, and it's an interesting application, it probably has some type of data associated with it. And how is that data going to be accessed by the different clients? Um, and 
If you're a client-side developer, you probably had a lot of logic on the client, but now you want to move that out because you want to be able to scale out to the cloud. You want to be able to support different kinds of clients. So you've got to worry about that. Um, if you're doing mobile apps, each of the mobile uh, platforms, iOS, Android, uh, Windows Phone, all, all have their, and Windows 8, all have their own notification mechanisms. Apple has APNS, um, Android has GCM, uh, there's WNS for, for Windows, and there's uh, a, a WPNS or MPNS for, uh, for Windows Phone. And so if you're trying to move that application to the cloud, you have to say, well, how am I going to deal with all these different notification mechanisms that are out there? That's going to be a challenge. And those notifications, they fire from the server. So I need a server somewhere to be able to do that. Um, background tasks. Uh, uh, so I, you know, when I was doing my client stuff, everything was local. But now I've moved to the server. Not everything is related to a user interaction, especially in this social world. I want to know that some tweet just happened that I care about, or somebody posted something on Facebook, um, or periodically, based on me doing something, I want to have like an activity stream that gets posted somewhere about the work that I'm doing. Um, so how can I handle that? And this is a big one. I mean, nowadays. Um, how many people have played around with apps that use OAuth? Is that easy? No. Not at all, right? And that spec is hard, let's just say. I was going to say horrendous, but let's just say hard. So you want, you know, as your app is moving to the cloud, people want to be able to use the existing identity providers out there. They want to be able to use their Google ID or they want to use um, their uh, Facebook or Twitter, very, very popular. Um, we also have Microsoft account. So I have to worry about this stuff that I didn't have to worry about before. Of course, there's scale. I need my app now to be able to scale as it grows. If, if I turn into an overnight success, I need to know that I'm going to be able to grow that application. Uh, monitoring, how do I know that things are working? And reach is a big one. Like, you know, today, it's, you're really cutting yourself off at the neck if you're just saying, well, I only support one. I only support this. Now, fair enough that there are some that you'll be cutting off your neck less. Um, you know, iOS, for example, has a huge uh, uh, market. Uh, Android has a huge market. But really, you want to have the ability to say, I can hit all of them. Um, if I have customers that are, if I have potential customers in each of those places, I want to design my apps so that I can have as many clients as I want talking to them. So these are the kind of problems that Azure Mobile Services is trying to help with. And again, I would say the focus here, when you think about this and you talk to your friends, is first about enabling that client-side developer to be able to build a full end-to-end server-side app without having to become a server-side programmer. Now, they may become a server-side programmer over time, but to be successful out of the gate, they don't have to be. So what is Azure Mobile Services? It's really a set of common services. I know it has services in it twice. It's a set of services that um, are application level. So like MongoDB is a service. If I, if I use hosted MongoDB, that's a general purpose database, for example. But these are app specific things like identity, identity as a service or data as a service. Um, so it's really giving you a backend that is tailored for a specific application where you don't have to deploy that backend yourself. That backend is managed for you. You can interact with it. You can surface it within your apps. Um, and you can tweak it. And one thing that's really important, so there was like a discussion earlier about, say, Backbone versus uh, Knockout versus Angular versus whatever. We don't care at all about the front end. And what I mean by that is we have different SDKs that allow you to, say, build an iOS app or build an Android app. But all we care about is providing you a bunch of services that are either surfacing data to those applications or allowing them to send data back, or they're dealing with things like authentication. But we don't take over your UI at all. The UI frameworks can be whatever you want them to be. So you can start small. You can grow. That's a key thing. Um, we use this term, uh, simplicity with enablement. Uh, this is Josh Twist, who's uh, one of the people who drove this vision. And the idea there is you can get going really quickly, but we're thinking really hard about how to make it so you don't hit a brick wall. So that you don't say, oh, that was great for me to just get going, but now if I want to do something a little bit more sophisticated, I'm stuck. And that's been a common problem, and there's no 
easy way to do that, but we feel right now we've been pretty successful doing that. Um, and also making it so that when you want to do more difficult things, it's not impossible. Like we often have said, uh, you know, make the, make the simple things easy, make the hard things possible, but possible tends to be like impossible. Like anybody who looks at it says, I would not do that. So we're not trying to do that. Uh, we want you to be able to bite off as much as you can chew and then this customize, which is, hey, it does a bunch of stuff out of the box. You know, Rails is all about convention over configuration. You'll actually see a lot of that here in Azure Mobile Services. There's a lot of things we just do for you out of the box. If you want to tweak it, you can tweak it and you can change it. And reiterating what I said before. So I think you do become a server-side programmer, but it's not the traditional server-side programmer. The con you know, you gradually get there. You don't have to suddenly buy off a lot of stuff just to get going. Um, so ultimately, if you're writing code on the server, you're a server-side programmer, but you become a server-side programmer where you focus on the things you care about, like business logic, and the server takes care of a lot of stuff for you. Now that's a holy grail, a lot of people have promised that, but at least out of the gate, that's the out of the gate experience. Over time, as you use this, you're probably going to become more of a server-side programmer. Might sound too good to be true, so I'll point out, it's not about being a silver bullet. In terms of the out-of-the-box experience, we're really targeting pretty simple applications. Um, you know, they can have a bunch of data and, and, and a bunch of logic, and I'll show you that. Um, and you can go much further, but then it's like you're taking it a bit into your own hands. We are, being, we are thinking about it, but we really do have a sweet spot in mind. I think even with Rails, like there is a sweet spot in mind of like what is the canonical Rails app. And I think we have a spectrum of what we think is the canonical app here. Um, but we certainly support more of that, and that will grow over time. So let's jump in and take a look at how this works. So what I was planning to do now, unless you guys change my mind, is um, we'll go through and actually just take an existing application that was not built with mobile services, and we'll plug mobile services in, and we'll see the whole end-to-end. -end. So it'll probably take about 30, 40 minutes for us to do that, or 30 minutes if we talk through it. Probably 30 minutes. Does that sound good? Okay. All right. So I'm going to close this. here. I'm going to Okay, so this is where we're going to be working is in this app right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to spin up a local web server. You don't have to do this when you're developing, when you're actually deploying, but just for, for So this is our kind of hello world, but this is not using Azure Mobile Services yet. This is just an in-memory kind of thing, right? So I have a task list. So think about a task list application where I can add tasks, I can remove tasks, I can mark them as completed. Um, I could get notifications when certain things happen. That's our start point. But it's not going to just be CRUD. It's not going to simply be that, you know, all my app does is just read data and then the client has to do all the logic. It's going to have some business logic. It's going to have validation. It's going to have identity. It's going to have a lot of things that it doesn't have right now. So um, if we just take a look at it behind the scenes to see what it looks like. You can see here it's just a very simple... HTML, and it's using some jQuery, and there's nothing else. 
And then if I go into app.js, you can see I got a bunch of functions like refresh to do items. Um, actually, there is one thing I need to open is this. Okay. Yeah. So I'm basically working against a static collection, a static array that's in memory right now. So if I click refresh, everything is gone. There's no cloud here. Okay? So it's pretty straightforward. Actually, I'm going to just take advantage of the multi window here. Let me go. One second, I'm trying to just get another window open, but now it's not letting me. Uh, let's see here. Okay, there we go. All right, so what I want to do is I want to um, create a mobile service and I want to wire this up. So I'm going to go into my browser and log into the Azure portal. And create my mobile service. I could have done this from the command line as well, but I'll show you the portal experience because it's pretty nice and it's easy to get off the ground with. So if I come in here, um, you can see that I have two mobile services previously created. I'm going to create a new one. So I'm going to click new and it's going to say, Hey, go create a mobile service and I got to give it a URL. So let's use uh, since JS mobile or actually, yeah, it's fine. Since JS mobile. So it says I can use an existing database instance or create a new one. We'll create a new one. And now it's going to prompt me for my server. So I'm going to create a new server and it's going to ask for my username. We'll call it SynCJS. And then it's going to ask me for a password. I think it's going to bitch again. So let's see. SynCJ dollar sign. Wait, capital C. SynCJ dollar sign PWD. C J dollar sign P W D. This is my least favorite part of this is having to figure out the password and remember it. So I'm going to click create. It should only take 30 seconds. Um, and what this is doing is it's provisioning for me an Azure SQL database. And you'll see how with mobile services, we don't want you to have to even know about SQL Server. There is a SQL Server there, and you can even interact with it directly if you want to. You can connect to it and tweak it. But Azure Mobile Services, part of that simplicity with enablement is um, it should just work for you. We should just manage it. And it has a very Rails-ish like behavior in terms of the fact that we will automatically surface that, uh, those database tables as APIs that you can then access. And you, we'll, we'll see how that works right now. So that's done. That was pretty fast. And if I click on this, it gives me two options. Well, first off, you can see that I can create an app for any one of these platforms. I can either create a new one, in which case we'll actually download for you a basic template. So here I've selected iOS. It's telling me to make sure I've installed Xcode and it's walking me through a basic hello world. We're not expecting for create new just to set the context here. This is really just an easy way for you to get playing with Azure mobile services and seeing something that's working with you know, doing some CRUD stuff. It's not to say that we expect that this will be your start point for your apps. So if I decide to um, connect to an existing app, we'll actually give you the connection information you need and show you how to set that up within your project. This is showing you how to set it up into Xcode. Um, we're gonna choose HTML, which is what we're doing now. And, and one of the things, you know, it really makes you love the web here is the number of things you have to do uh, in HTML, it's just really simple. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this block here, 
the script block and put that over into our app. Where is my thing? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move this. So let's see, can I move that over? There we go. There we go. So uh, I'm gonna go into my index.html. I'm gonna whack this, and I'm gonna paste. So this is just like I would download jQuery, only in this case I'm downloading the Azure Mobile Services Client SDK. And what's really cool about this SDK is once you've wired it up from like the Chrome debugger, you can just interact with it directly from the window. So I'm going to show you that. So, um, so then what I have to do is put this block of code here. This creates my Azure Mobile Service Client. Just to tell you what those two pieces of information is, the first one is the URI. The second one may look like a secret. It's not a secret. It's just a unique ID. It's a unique ID that matches to your service. Um, and that's the way that we know that this is the API that you want to talk to. We'll get into auth a little bit later on how you do that securely. So what I'm going to do is one more thing. And this is what I love about the web. Is I'm going to set window.client equal to client. And what that's going to allow me to do then I should have kept that open because we're going to have to come back into it. Is uh, I can now go to the Chrome debugger and you can see that I have a client. So just to show you what Azure Mobile Services is, let's play with it for a bit right from the Chrome debugger. It's the best way to see what the APIs are. Um, so at the end of the day, what the client is going to allow you to do is two things. It's going to allow you to authenticate. We make OAuth really easy. We make it really simple with a single line of code to actually support Twitter, Facebook, all these things on the client um, for authentication. And then the other thing we do is we give you a bunch of CRUD APIs that allow you to do create, read, update, delete type operations against those, uh, the tables that you have in the back end, um, which I'll show you in a minute. Now, SQL Server is not a NoSQL database, but one of the really cool things here is we, we automatically adjust the schema based on the things you pass. So let's see how that works. So first what I'm going to do is get a table, and I'm going to uh, call client.getTable. And the table that I'm going to get is called todoItem. But I got it. Here it is. And now I want to read some data from that table. So what I can do is say table.read. And now here, we actually support promises. You guys familiar with promises? Mm -hmm. Right, so for async. So I can call, I can put a then here, and then say function, you know, items. And then I can say console.log items. So I got a 404. Why did I get a 404? Why do you think I got a 404? Right. Table doesn't exist yet. So you can use the command line tools to do this. I'm just going to do it here, but you can actually create those tables right from the command line. It's a single, well, I'll just show you. It's a, it's a single command. You can do Azure uh, mobile table. I can do Azure mobile table create service name, create the table, or I can do it from the portal. Where do you want to see it? <laughs> we could do both. Fine. We could do both. So I'm going to come here first, and then I'm going to go to the data, and I'm going to click Add Table, and I'm going to say Create for me to do item. So that's going to create for me the table. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to modify the schema or anything. It, that'll all be taken care of for me. Then I'm going to delete that table, which is silly. I normally wouldn't do that, so I can then create it through the command line. So now I'm going to say Azure mobile table create. Um, my service name was CincyJS mobile. And I'm going to create to do item. I haven't tried this recently, so I'm hoping it's going to work. 
It is. The portal is actually just a consumer of the API. Um, so it seems to be taking longer for some reason. Yep, oh, it's done. All right, so if I refresh. There it is. So you can do both. Yeah, basically the, the CLI and the portal are just consumers of the same API, which is kind of nice. Um, one other thing about our CLI that's kind of cool, we have this dash dash JSON. If you want to do automation against our CLI, we'll return JSON objects. So you could actually write node code that does that. And I even created a little open source module. This is a shameless plug, and not, not too many people are using it, but I'll show it to you anyway, um, called Azure Scripty. And what Azure Scripty does is, um, it takes advantage of that and lets you do little automation scripts that use the CLI almost as like an API. And it deals with the fact that it's JSON objects. Um, so it passes that dash dash JSON switch for you. So it's kind of cool. It lets you do automation stuff where you're using Node as a scripting language for automation um, against that command line tool. Shameless plug. Moving on. Okay, so now I've created that table. So I should be able to retry this and it should work. Okay, so now I got an empty collection, which means it actually succeeded. So then what I can do is uh, table dot insert. And all I do is pass it a JSON object. Um, so I can pass it a JSON object that has text because this is what the structure is going to be. I can pass it text of uh, my first task. And then I can pass it um, complete colon false. And then if I go do this, see, I get it back. So that's really, from a client perspective, that is Azure Mobile Services on the data side. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, we'll get to auth. Now, there's no security hole here because I chose, you know, I chose to expose this API so that you could run it through the Chrome debugger. I can certainly uh, not do that and just have that be an inner function. But then, of course, somebody could look at the code and they could copy it down. So yes, we can lock down the data so that unless you're authenticated, you can't get in. And I'll, I'll show you that. Any questions on this? So is there, is there like an HTTP CRUD interface? Yes. Automatic. Remember I was telling you how we believe in kind of this convention over config type thing, which is like, hey, you create a table. Automatically, we think that means you want an API to expose it. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if you look at the network monitor, you'll see it. It's a very simple, I don't know if you guys have heard of OData, mm -hmm. but if you have, this actually is using, um, is using OData. So you can see here it's passing to date tables slash to do item. Okay. And we actually support query syntax as well for doing filtering, where the filtering runs on the server. So you I'm, could, I mean, you could hook this up to, a, to an Ember app. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, my partner in crime... Uh, Steve Sanderson, who wrote Knockout, actually, uh, and I think he's doing a blog post on this, he's demoed taking Adi Osmani's um, Backbone app and wiring up Backbone to use this. You remember I said to you how we really don't care about the UI. So all this is is an API. You can wire it up to whatever framework you like. Do you, would you want to do that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Tell your friends. <laughs> All right, so we've got the basics. Now let's go further and just plug it in, which is really just straightforward. I mean, we're really just going to use all those commands that we saw until we get to... Um, last night when I demoed this, I forgot to do this, and it was an awkward moment because I was getting errors, and I couldn't figure out why, and it's, you know... It's not fun when that happens when you're in front of a lot of people. So I'm just going to set myself up right this time. Okay, so I've done that. 
I'm going to get rid of this because this is all the static stuff that I don't need anymore. And then what I'm going to do is grab a version of Refresh, which is very similar. And I'll show you the before and after before I paste it. Okay, so this is Refresh before. And you see that it was going against static items. Refresh after. We have a notion of queries with filters. The reason this is here is because I'm going to show you filters in a bit. Um, so now what I've done is I've gotten rid of the static. I'm grabbing my table, which is exactly what you saw me do from the Chrome debugger. Um, I'm now calling read. I'm using the promise, writing out the items. And I'm then um, using jQuery and I'm populating my UI. If you wanted to use something like handlebars or whatever, I mean, that's really up to you. We don't, we don't care. Um, and that's it. So I should be able to just refresh and see my data show up. There we go, my first task. Now, I, this is probably obvious, but you know, I remember I said to you, well, I said mobile services, but we're just running in a browser. So you could write a Rails app today. One of you guys, I put you through the challenge. You can write a Rails app that basically utilizes Azure Mobile Services on the front end because of the fact that we support the origin server. So you could have a Rails app. Now, you might say, why would I do that? And there's different reasons why you might do that. You might like Rails for the UI, but you want to basically take advantage of Azure Mobile Services for auth or for auth end data. Or maybe you're doing a combination of things and you're saying, well, you know, I've got my stuff that Rails generates for me, and then I have some other stuff that I'm using Azure Mobile Services for, maybe because it also drives a mobile, uh, a pure mobile application. So you can do hybrids. Um, now you, you mentioned that there was core support yep. into this. Yep. So you, can, you can just hit URL. Great question. So if I come out to my mobile service here, sorry, not on tables. We'll get to tables in a minute. Um, if I go to configure, so one thing you see is this dynamic schema. Uh, I'll show you what that implies in a minute. But you see this cross origin resource sharing? So by default, we put localhost. So what you would do here is you would add the website that you want to give permission. And then we'll automatically create the right headers so that the browser will just let it work. It's working here. I'm doing a cross domain call now because I'm serving it up from localhost. And then I'm going back to the server. And it's working because it's using cores right now on localhost. And since you're, since you're a Microsoft guy, how far back does IE support this? IE supports cores. Uh, oh, I don't know how far back. Uh, I definitely, I, I, I would expect 9 and 10. Um, I, don't, I don't know about 8, okay. but I'm not the expert. I think there's a shim that gives some run. OK. So and, and you know, I think, again, if you go back to that, simplicity with enablement, this kind of thing, you know, like having the portal just makes these kind of things really, really easy to set up and you don't have to, you know, so this is a place where I think, think about what it would take for you to do that yourself, like if you're writing a Rails app. You could do it, you'd have to write some kind of middleware or something that will embed the course header or something like that. This is just making it so, you know, imagine the guy who's never done server-side programming before, that's scary, but even if I have, it's doing things that I don't really want to do. I'll do it if I have to do it. Yeah. All right, so we can now go further and add other things like insert, update, etc. So we'll go add insert. It's going to be the same thing. The main thing that's going to change is here I'm doing static items. And now I've changed to do to do item table dot insert. Okay, so once I've enabled that, I can go and refresh. And now I can say another task. That's now been persisted because I use the insert method. And let me show you what the schema thing means um, because you can disable that as well. So here's my table. And you remember when I created it, I didn't create any columns. Um, those columns just showed up. So this is kind of that convention over config thing as well of saying, hey, by default, whatever you send, we're basically going to add those columns. You can turn that off. You can turn that off by going to that option I just had of disabling dynamic schema. Does that make your queries faster? 
No. Um, the only thing this does, I think, is say that we, we know what the schema of the table looks like. And if we see that you've added something that is not there, that initial query is going to be a little bit slower. But it wasn't noticeably slower because we're going to go and update the table schema to support that. Um, what about the indexing, the columns? Or? So we don't do any indexing. But this is a full SQL Server database. So what you can do here is if you go to configure, you can see that I have access here to my SQL database. And if I click on this, I can actually go in and um, design it I can connect to it. I can add indexes, do all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things you have to do is set up, we have, um, so Azure SQL database has firewall rules. And the firewall rules mean unless those rules are activated, you won't be able to connect to it from your client. So this convenient link here will look at your IP address and add it uh, to the reserve table so that you can then use SQL, any kind of SQL tools to connect to modify the schema. So yeah, that is part of, again, the simplicity with enablement. By default, we just have the ID for lookups. Um, and a lot of people are building apps where that's even sufficient for a lot of their, you know, simple CRUD apps. But if you want to do more sophisticated searches, um, you can absolutely add tables. You could even add views. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server supports the concept of views. And you can create virtual tables even that go and aggregate data from multiple places or that don't even use a database. And I'll show you that. Or like let's say you decided to use MongoDB. You can take it in your own hands, that's part of the enablement part, and say, my API talks to Mongo as opposed to talking to SQL. Does that make sense? OK. I've got a question real quick. So the, the dynamic schema thing, is it if you put a bunch of Boolean values in there, is it guessing that it's a Boolean field? Put date values, is it guessing it's data, is it all text? It has some guessing. Um, I think it does have some guessing. Uh, I can double check on that. Let me take a note that's on that. Yeah, yeah that's a great, stuff. no, that's a great point. So. It might be they're all text. I'm not sure. And then you could go and change it too. Um, you can also add them specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So you have. Um, so first off, from here, from my mobile site. If I go to data to do item, I have columns. So I look at columns. I can add and remove columns. It'll show me what the types are. So we are guessing. Nice. And those are both, yeah, those are both. I mean, those are true false. I don't know how far we go. Like, if you put yes, no, I think I'll probably think it's a string. I think we're just making a special casing for true false. Um, you might get in problems too if we think something is a number and then you suddenly try to send some text to it. Right. But that's why you have the ability here to get some control um, if you want to. I can add a new column. Um, I don't think I can. Oh, and you see I have it indexed. Ah, wow, I just learned something. You can just click set index to make columns individually indexable. There we go. I just indexed it. So that answers your, so I was wrong. See, I'm learning something new here. So many hidden jewels in mobile services. <laughs> I think even last night I was asked in front of 80 people. And I was like, yeah, you can go to SQL Server and you can add your indexes. And I, I, I got to be careful now because now I'm using simplicity with enablement for things that are already simple. I'm saying those are enabled. Ah, it's the problem when you join a new team. Okay. Um, so let's finish this out. We don't need to watch it all. It's just going to be mundane to watch everything. So I'll just go edit the rest of the stuff in. Um, so we'll take update. I should just copy the comments, but. So the reason why there's two updates there is I have the ability to edit the text or mark it as completed. And then I have delete. 
Okay, so now I should be able to do things like edited, and that one and edited it, and I could go and delete. I can mark stuff as completed, um, or I can delete stuff. So I got crud, full crud. Unsecure, full unsecure cred. <laughs> That's the best kind of <laughs> so we actually do support filtering. Um, and the filtering uses OData in a pretty interesting way. So what I can do is um, I can go up here. And instead of doing this, I can do this. So the simple filtering we support is where you can pass us a JSON object of key values for column names and values, and we will match up those automatically for you. That's simple. But we do support more sophisticated stuff as well. So what I've done now is I've said that I won't show anything that is completed. So let's, um, so I've just marked this as completed. It should disappear. If I say uh, yet another task, that shows up. Okay, so that was the simple filtering. But then I can get a bit more advanced. And I can actually give it an expression. All right, so. Oh, yeah, here. So this is actually pretty cool. I think this broke yesterday, so let's see if it works. Um, but what this allows me to do is actually just write code in this function, and we analyze the code. It's kind of link for you know a simple link if you're familiar with .NET, um, and we turn it into an OData query. So this is not bringing everything down to the client to then do the filtering. It's actually turning that into what will go to the database. So you won't have a million records coming down, for example. So, so let's see if that works. Um, so let's refresh. So everything came back, of course. But if I put hide, it shouldn't show up. It doesn't. Can you flip to the, uh, the, the data Chrome, view? The Chrome that you were looking at earlier, or the Chrome tool you were looking at earlier that was showing the HTTP. Yeah, you want to see what the request looks like? Yes. OK. Yeah. So you can see here, it's actually pretty cool what it's doing. And it will bark at you if you try to use an expression it doesn't understand. Like if you try to use char at, for example, that's not supported uh, in OData, or at least in what we're, so that, that's going to fail. Um, but it's pretty nice because it ensures that you're not going to get all the data in the world. and you know, one of the things whenever you use something magical like this is you might write a filter that I don't want you to write. Maybe I've detected that you're not giving me enough criteria to filter against, and I don't want you to do this massive query against my database. Um, so what we allow you to do on the server side, which we're going to get into the scripting in a minute, um, is you can actually get access to that filter and either throw it out or further constrain it or throw back an exception, you know, a response to the user that says, give me some more information, I'm not going to give you that filter or whatever. So again, that's kind of that simplicity thing of like by default, yeah, it just works, but you can harden it up if you want to. Um, and if, if you are going to do that, what do you, like, what do you write that in? We'll see that okay. in a second. You guys are a JavaScript group, right? Hint. Yes, we are. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so that's filtering. So we're right in time for the next one. So let's say I want to add some validation. Now, you already know that mobile services supports multiple clients. So I just want to do validation that says that the task can't be more than 10 characters, or 15. I already violated that on 10. Um, so if you try to add a task that is greater than, say, 15 or 10, I want it to fail. So this is that place where I need to now write validation. And I don't want that validation to be on the client. 
So by default, I haven't had to write any code on the server. And that is part of the kind of convention base or the getting off the ground experience. But we make it so that you can write lots of code to customize. And that code is written in? Yes. So if we come back here, you'll see we have, um, if I click on the table, I have this script option. So this is what insert looks like. I get the item, which is a JSON object. I get the user, which right now I don't have auth activated, so user is going to be nothing. But we'll see what happens when I turn that on. That will actually give me the ID of the user so that I can filter against that or match against it. And I get access to the request. Um, and one of the things we've done with request is we've actually incorporated the request module from Michael Rogers so that from here, I can actually make HTTP calls out to anything um, and do that in a non-blocking way because this is Node. Um, it gets really cool because if I never call request.execute, and this gets into where we support the ability for use these, this maps to post. So let's say I just want to do an action that performs something. All I do is today, it's a little hacky, but it it's perfectly works and people are doing this. I create a table. If I remove request.execute, it will never hit the database. So if I wanted to make this work with Mongo, for example, I could, because I could just use the Mongo, make HTTP calls against the Mongo database. But if I wanted to perform some work like a process, I can do that as well. Because insert maps to post. So it's just a post. And you give me a body, which is the payload that needs to get processed, and I could do the processing. But what I can also do is validation here and say, hey, if your item.txt is greater than 10 or 15, I'm going to give you back an error. And so the way I do that is here. So I'm going to copy this in. So respond is basically, by default, we will always call respond eventually. Respond is your way of saying within your code of your script, send back a response right now. So now I'm sending back a response that says text length must be under 10. Yep? I'm getting it way ahead of you, I'm sure. But what if you don't want to write code in the text area in the browser tab? Um, good, good question. So today, what we allow you to do is um, if you go to our CLI, mm. you can actually upload and download scripts. Um, so Yep. Okay. Um, we are going to have a repository soon. We don't have that yet. So script download. Yep. Script download, script upload, script delete. Um, and there's a convention of what you name those things so it maps correctly. But you can say like Azure Mobile Script List, for example. I think right now, um, so it's going to ask for my mobile service name, which was what, since EJS Mobile. So we do allow that today. No scripts because I haven't hit save yet. If I click save. That was insert though, right? Not list. Oh, it's oh, no, 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 but watch. Oh, okay. No, just watch. Okay. I'll save it. That's a great question, by the way. It's a great question. Um, actually, let me write that down, because I want to write down the questions I get. So can I uh, create scripts? I like typing in the text box. Not so much. I can't imagine. <laughs> As a Vimmer. <laughs> And that's the convention um, today. We're gonna, the scripts model is going to change a bit about how they surface. Today, it is very convention-based. You have to name it table slash because we have things that don't relate to tables. Mm -hmm. You can have shared scripts that are shared across also. You can take your common code and put it in a shared script that is then used across your other scripts, and you can require it. Um, so you know, why is this here? And this is actually going to get much better soon. It's going to have syntax completion and, I don't know, might eventually have debugging, um, which will be cool, like actually debugging on the server, you know, like Cloud9 had, has, um, that kind of model. But um, the, this is simple, mm -hmm. right, for the person who's just getting started and just tinkering. But yes, you can, we certainly want to support more complex workflows. 
All right, so we've done that, and that should be in place right now, but if I run it, it's going to fail because now I'm going to get an error back. So what I'm going to do is do a slight change here. Because um, it will be a status code. If, if, you type one that was if I oh, type, if I do a greater than ten, but yeah. Your, your existing ones are no, no, I won't get it. Yeah, yeah, I won't get an error there. Yeah, good, good point. Um, so, all I'm doing here is this is a promise. So I can pass it a hand, you know, a, 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 call, a callback for handling errors. Can you make your sidebar smaller? Yeah, it's getting in the way. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, there's something wrong with this. Last time I did this, it didn't work right. Let's see what happens. I think it's going to, it may show as an object. Uh, or let's see what happens. So I will refresh. And now I'll, actually, yeah, I needed that because I needed to refresh the latest. So now I'm going to say a long task name. Yeah, it's because of this. Uh, I think it's just. Let me just see if it's this. Okay. So that's simple validation, but you can do other things like um, you can actually modify the item before it gets persisted, and that might be useful for something like a timestamp. That's a good question. Um, I think you can. Let's try it. I haven't tried it, but I don't see why that won't work. I guess, you know, if you send back text, it'll send back to JSON, right? Yeah. Uh, question will be how will it get received on the other side, but let's see. So if I say error colon um, text cannot exceed 10. That's a very boring description, but whatever. I don't see why it won't work. It should work. So it did return the JSON object. Um, but then I have to, yeah, so then I would have to change my code. Let's do this now because we, we went through all this. Yeah, we did all of this. Uh, so then I don't need that anymore. So now, error dot. Well, I think this has to be dot error here. I think the way this works, it's. Um, I think it's got to be this way because this is. This is a local error. It's not the error coming back. It's the way it hangs off. You get access to the request. It's a little, yeah. It's a, it, it probably needs to be cleaned up a bit. I think. Um, you got too many prompts. Did I? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Which is why it failed. That's the thing you gotta love that about JavaScript. <laughs> hmm. What do we want to see in the debug? Oh, what's coming back? Yeah, I am parsing it. Oh, 
Wait, that's your snippets. Oh, is that where I made the? Yeah, this is where you were here. You're not parsing. Yeah, you're not parsing. But you know, how is that? But I think. Oh, so you're thinking it's, it's back to what I had before, like. Yeah, you probably have to parse that response text. And then do dot error on it. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. No, I think you're right. Let's. Yeah, there's a little too many errors hanging around there, but <laughs> let's, yeah. Let's. Hey! So what I need to do is actually save that snippet, because that's a better snippet. So let me just, I'm going to do this demo again very soon. Um, so let me save this. Good, good job, guys. So, as soon as Saturday. <laughs> the only problem now, I'm going to have to change it in two places. Um, well, your alerts can be decided. Yeah. Yeah. No, what I need to do is uh, this one line or. I just need to change it in one other place because I override that function again here. And then it'll be like, oh, it works, and then it'll break when I go. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this is a good feedback that we should probably update this. Um, Okay, we're cruising now. All right, so um, so we talked about adding the timestamp, which, as a matter of fact, the change that I just made, I screwed up because I just added that. Okay, that's what I want. Right. Isn't that what I had before? I think so. When I started off, yeah. Right. Okay. So I got to make another change, though, um, because I want to now show the time span. So what I'm doing he here on the server is I'm now saying that, hey, whenever a request uh, to, a to create comes in, I want to tack on this timestamp. And then I want to surface that back to the UI. And so um, the other part of that, actually, oh, so you see I've already got this filter, which is saying that, so when I did this, it did a couple of things. Um, it applied a filter that said, hey, I'm only going to show things that have a timestamp. So you can see that I can do more complex filters here. And then the other thing it's doing here is just adding the timestamp so it shows up. I'm pulling out the two date string and the two locale time string. So, um, which is what I expect. Can you go back to your schema once? Is it, did it actually mm -hmm. consider that a date now? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Um, your guess is as good as mine. Okay, so I think it did. Yeah. This one is actually probably easier because remember, I set this on the server. So it had the real JSON object that I had just created. So it probably was able to actually look at it and say, oh yeah, this is, this is a date. Depending on, yeah, depending on how the JSON parser handles it, yep. Yeah, which we, yeah. 
Those are dark days. We don't like to talk about them. All right, so let's take a two or three minute break and then we'll get to off. How's it, how's it feeling so far? Good? Are you guys running out of steam? You want me to keep going? You want me to show identity? We can stop after identity if you want. And we can also, if you guys want to, we could you know, do a mini pairing kind of thing if you guys want to start playing around. We could do that too. I could hang around and you know, we could spend 30 minutes or just playing around trying to build something. A what? Like a backbone sync. Uh, what do you call it? Are they call them adapters. Is that oh for Azure Mobile Services? So you just like. It's fairly new, but it was in the summer. Let's let's see. I find it hard not to do something. The API looks pretty simple. <coughs> yeah, I mean you can write a. So it's like adapter for the Uh. I mean, I would like. Why don't one of you guys build it? I would use the keyword it, sync. Well, the OData part is the challenge. You'll have to support the OData query format. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. You'd have to translate that, um, which is easy to, you know, it's documented what that looks like. Um, using Backbone with jQuery. Yes, yeah. in Backbone, the method's called sync. That this is a great idea, though. Uh, let me document it. So here's where it may not have been. We didn't have this HTTP. This, you guys are one of the first people to see this new HTML5 SDK. This shipped less than a week ago. So I was, that's why I was excited when I found out I was coming timing-wise. Right. You guys are the first. Right? Or one of the first. So, I mean, if you want to pair up and do that, yeah, let's do it. Um, let me take a note on that, though. That's a great idea. So have a backbone. Okay, so we'll take another two minutes. Auth will be really fast, actually, and it's 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 pretty beautiful how fast it is. So just for like reference, I've kind of always wanted something like this. I always wanted to build a, a couch. <laughs> couch <laughs> implementation of something. Couch is beautiful where, until it got a fan. Like I don't have to do anything with it. It's just a back end, and I can like dump my app in there. And, and so just to reiterate, like where those script blocks are, you can override it to talk to anything. Um, now, what we don't allow you to do yet, we have a white list of node modules. But well, the only reason I was talking about Couch is because the Couch, had, Couch was a NoSQL store with a, an HTTP like endpoint. Endpoint, yeah, sure. And this is kind of Mongo like also has a HTTP, like yeah. Um, yeah, so we don't have Couch in Azure yet. The, the, we, I'm hoping to change that. I'm, I'm working to try to change that. Um, I don't even know if we need it anymore. Yeah, yeah I think it's yeah. kind of died, yeah, unfortunately. Well, NPM uses it. They would disagree. <laughs> well, I think they're trying to get off of it. They're trying to get off of it. Are After they? After that time, they accidentally left every couch. Because couch is like totally insecure by default. And they couldn't somebody just delete the whole <laughs> NPM repo or something. So the, the, the six guys that started couch just like quit when it got them. Yeah, so I, the Iris Couch guys, uh, you know, Jason is still uh, active. Committer on that. What do you think is awesome about it? What do you like about it? I've never used it, so I've used Mongo, Redis. Oh, I remember this. I could run, I could serve my website from within yeah, Couch where it just points back. And it's built to be cloned. It's built yeah. to be synced. The whole so, point was that you share your couches. So you know who did that was uh, Oren with Raven. He copied that model. He said your, the admin tool for Raven lives within Raven itself. was the couch, and it lives within Couch. Yeah. Okay. Let's get some water. So what, I mean, it's been a long time since I so let me ask you guys something. So what you're seeing, what would block you from using this? Or are there any, do you see any blocker? Or Obviously do you see? Hmm? I mean, if you're doing a backbone. Oh, you mean mobile, mobile, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's just no, HTTP, some, like that's all we care about. If you're doing a, a, a backbone app, a rich client type thing, I mean, 
It's definitely worth looking at. So, I, mean, I mean, the only thing is, like, I mean, as much as I love these kind of demos, it's just like, you get to those really complex use cases where you're doing crazy, like, cross-domain stuff, and then... What else is existing you know, legacy data? And it sounds like, you know, with that request object, you can just request other domains. And that is what people are doing. So, so let me say, again, I mean, even though I'm... I'm very cognizant of not wanting to make you think because I show you a demo that that demo means that's what you're going to actually build. Yeah. But what I am trying to illustrate within the demo is the hooks are there to go way further. So uh, to learn that, one of the guys on my team, uh, Josh Twist actually, who was kind of the driver of this, he built this app called, uh, I'm always going to pronounce it wrong, I think it's Dotu, but it might be Dotu. Uh, it's a task-based app using, it's an iOS application, it's in the store. And it uses push notifications and all this stuff. And it's pretty sophisticated. And it basically allows you to share lists of things with your partner or with other people. And when you update it, they all see it. And it, it's kind of cool. You can send tasks to other people. Um, and he built it so that he could see how this really fares up in the real world. And I think what he found, which was maybe a bit surprising, was he was writing quite a lot of scripts on the server. Because once you get into a real app, the logic gets pretty complicated once you start dealing with off. One of the things that has helped him to do is to see where our gaps are. Like, yes, we enable this, but you know what? This is common enough. Everybody's going, why should I have to write 10 lines of code to do this thing? It should just work. So this is also turning into a nice way to help us at least look at some things and say, hey, we really need to make this better. We don't want you to have to write this yourself. Um, and one of the things that came out of that, I think, was the value we would have if we could just let you use whatever NPM modules you wanted. Yeah. Um, so so you, said, you, you mentioned whitelisted modules. So there are some modules, like with C extensions, that you don't allow? No. Oh, that's different. Actually, native modules don't have a great story today <laughs> in, in, in Azure websites. Is that a, how, how important are native modules for you? Well, not for me personally, not at all. No. But I know that some are they've been um there's been a migration i think to a large like even mongo for example now has a javascript module that they say is even faster than their their native one um there have been a lot of uh improvements made there we do support native modules within cloud services our website story we support some of them we don't build them on the fly so we don't have that because of the fact you're running in an isolated sandbox and the memory utilization required to run building Python and, and, and Visual Studio, actually, to build C++ is heavy. Um, but um, what I mean by whitelist is that within mobile services today, there's a fixed set of modules that are available. There's request, there's our Azure module, there's pusher, there's SendGrid, there's a list of a few. Um, we're going to open that up. We're going to allow you to say that I can send in my GitHub repo a package.json and then pull whatever I want. Um, native still won't work, but anything else, including you creating your own modules mm -hmm. and publishing those, say, to a Git repo or putting them in NPM. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's coming, that and that will allow for much more sophisticated apps because you can right. modularize everything using, you know. So if, I, if I were to move from like my Node Jitsi platform, I, I mean, I've got ten packages that I would yeah. On, so yeah, and you saw that when I deployed my website, that was not a problem. In my website, I had Express and Jade, and that was just, that was not a whitelist. That was, you saw it running, oh, spilled, it's just water. Um, that ran NPM on the server. So what's going to happen soon in the future is we will run NPM for you oh. when you deploy your, web, okay. your, your mobile app. So it does, it, it does allow Yeah, it just doesn't allow it now, but it will be very shortly. Okay, okay but that's, that's good feedback, too. Let me take that down. Hmm. Um, so let's go forward into auth. So what I want to do is I want to make it so that you have to log in with your Facebook auth. Um, you want, I want you to use Facebook. And if you're not logged in with Facebook, then all you can do is read data. You can't update it. So let, let's see what it would take to do that. Um, so I've previously set up on Facebook my own app. So I need to update this to be since JS mobile. And then I need to update this canvas URL. Uh, 
and it takes a few minutes. This is the important part. So I've got my app ID and my app secret. That's what I need to be able to use Facebook for auth. So I'm going to go into my, uh, I'm going to copy this app ID here. And if I go into my mobile service, I have this identity tab. And so from the identity tab, I can select any one of these and I can support all of them. And you can even create custom ones. That's where you're going outside of the portal into script. But Josh Twist, whose blog is um, Joy of Code. I think it's joyofcode.com, but I always get that wrong. It might be .net. No, it's not joyofcode.com. It's, it? it's the Joy of Code. <laughs> the Joy of Code. So, yep, you can see that's actually mobile services right there. So, it's actually a really good blog because he's A, been chronicling his experiences as he tries to build this Do2 app and what he goes through and how to deal with versioning strategy and all this stuff um, and, and just building out a real application and what are the challenges. And he's, he's just got a lot of good stuff, including what if I want to plug in my own auth provider? I don't want to use the ones on your list. But we're going to use the ones on our list. So we're going to go here and drop in my API key and then drop in my app secret. So that's all I've done. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I want to lock this down. So if I go to my data, each table has a permissions tab. I can also apply my own custom permissions. So again, this is the simple stuff out of the box. So right now, it's saying that anybody with the app key, and that's why I said that's not a secret, that's just an ID, is allowed to do whatever they want. But I want to lock that down, so I'm going to say that only authenticated users can do insert, update, or delete. Now you might say, well, I don't want it to only be authenticated users. I want it to be users that are part of some group or something like that. And I can do that. That requires me to write some code. But I still would do this, which would, because this is what will trigger that when a request comes in, it will get unauthorized if the users automatically if the user is not logged in. And then if it passes that level, I could then write my own script that does further logic based on who it is to see what groups they're part of, etc. So that is all I have to do on the server to just get this working. Immediately, if I go back to my app now and I try to insert, so it's giving me an error. It's just not handling it right now. Oh, there we go, unauthorized. So I'm now set up from the server that it is now locked down. I can read. You can see I can read, no problem. But I cannot uh, update. I cannot delete. It's not going to delete. So, um, so let's see what it takes. And this is where I think uh, Azure Mobile Services really shines on how easy it makes this. It literally is one line of code to log in. And anybody who's dealt with OAuth before knows the dance and stuff you have to go through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a bunch of little functions. Well, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, put some changes in the markup for the HTML markup. Um, here. That is just going to tell me whether I'm logged in or not. Just simple div stuff. And then I'm going to go and copy this stuff in, which is these few functions. And all that is doing right now is updating the display as to what, by checking the current user. So once a user is authenticated, the client will expose a current user object. 
All that is is an ID. It's, it's not their name even. We don't give that information because we care about security. It's just an ID that uniquely identifies them in our system. Um, but this is all I need to do to say login with Facebook. If I change that to Twitter, then it's expecting login to be on Twitter. So I can actually let people choose, have some UI that says, we don't do the UI for you. Choose which one you want. And then based on that, you call the correct function. You, know, you, call, you pass in the correct parameter so that it uses that authentication model. Um, and then the last thing I need to do is just force that code to run. And that should be it. So let's try it out. So it says I'm not logged in. And we know that I couldn't before add data because I was locked down. So let me log in. So I had already been logged into Facebook. So I was able to pick that up. And now if I say oh, that's probably going to blow up because it's more than 10. <laughs> Doesn't stop there though. So what I can do then is I can go back into my scripts and on insert or on okay, let's take read. Well, so on insert, what I can start, what I can do is I can modify my data so that when you create something, I actually store who the user is. And then I can go back to my select, uh, for example. And I have access to the query that you've sent me. And I can further apply a filter on it, which will return me a new query. And say query.where. I think it's this way. I, I don't remember the syntax. But I think it's like this. Query.where. And then I would say user colon user.id. I think that'll work, but I'm not positive. Um, but it's something like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah, new query. Yeah. I'm not positive that syntax is correct. And maybe that I just somehow edit the query, but actually, let me just check so I don't. I'll show you our documentation, our walkthroughs, which are pretty nice. So you can go here and go to mobile. Users, use scripts to authorize users. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Okay, so it's this. So you, yep, we just call it and change it. Yeah, so it's modifying it. Okay, glad I tried that out then. Which means this would have failed, but the other one probably would have been fine. It just wouldn't have returned anything. Um, That's what I would do. So now I've recorded the ID when the records get created. I've made sure that now when I'm querying. I think you don't want user ID. I oh, I called it user. Yep. Which that is going to apply on top of whatever query you gave me. So this is appending it. Um, and I think overwriting it as well, like if somebody tried to hack that. Um, so, um, but then you could also imagine doing other things like, you know, I, I don't just filter based on your user ID. Maybe I have some group information or other things stored in other tables. One of the things I want to point out for what I just mentioned, so there are some tables that I never want you to see, but they're just useful for me. I manage them, but they're useful as part of my application. So when you create a table, um, you can actually modify that table and say that the only one who has access to this is scripts and admins. So we have this thing called a master key. The master key should never be shared. But if you wanted to have your Rails app 
be able to talk to this as an admin, we have a special header. And with that header, what you could do is you can pass that master key value. And if you do that, you're basically giving it God access, so to speak. And you're saying, hey, you can do whatever you want with the APIs. Um, but even if you're not allowing it external, by using admins and scripts, you're saying, hey, this is something that just my scripts use. Only they have access to do stuff. It never surfaces to the user. So any request from the outside will be denied unless it has that key, uh, that master key, which you should never give out, and it's never exposed. OK? So we've seen auth. Um, I'm going to unroll what I did there with the data. Well, actually, let's, let's see what will happen. So if I try to run it the first time, nothing will work. If I try to then create records, it should work. Let's try it. So if I go back here, refresh. Now I see nothing. Oh, yeah. i got to log in. So I'll log in. Hello. Oh. Uh, did I use the wrong script? Your insert. Yeah, that's what I'm going to look right now. Oh, no. Should have. User ID. It was user ID. Was it? The one you copied from Actually, that. let's just look here. User.UserID. OK. Ah. OK, so this would be. Just I'm just checking. Yeah, that, that would be the right way to do it. <laughs> okay, so we'll put that. Oh, so I had it right over here. I just didn't have it right on the other side. User.UserID. User.UserID. OK, let's try it again. You're not logged in. I knew that. There we go. So now we've got data security. So the last thing I want to show you is push. Um, even though we're in a browser and we're HTML5 or we're phone gap, we actually do support pusher. Um, so do you guys know about pusher? Yeah. Yeah, you can use web so It basically allows you to have a WebSocket connection to the pusher service. Um, and then you can have apps that push messages. And then they, it's, it's like doing WebSockets, only it's not WebSockets directly to you. It's WebSockets to another service, which Pusher has, which is very scalable, and you just push a message to Pusher and it comes back. But it's all real time. That's the thing. You have a persistent connection with Pusher. So you get that bi directional, very rich um, experience. And it's useful because Pusher allows you to do channels and events. So you could imagine 100,000 clients listening on Pusher real time. And you push that message, and immediately it's, it's broadcast. And, and why it's interesting, I think. Um, in general as a technology, even if it was native, um, is that the native push notification mechanisms are not designed to be real time. It's more of like an FYI. It's within the last minute, within the last 30 seconds, whereas this is like stock quotes, right? 30 seconds, that stock might be gone or the price went down already. I want to get it right away. Or imagine chat. You want to do the canonical chat application. Um, so let's see how you do Pusher. So Pusher is actually in the Azure store. So if I, uh, if I come back here, um, you can actually see that I've already deployed a Pusher app. And so I can get my connection info. And what's nice too is I can even jump to the Pusher portal. And what Pusher has that's pretty nice is they actually have a dashboard, a debug console. So you can monitor real time as the messages are being sent from your app, which is actually cool. And it's good for debugging because sometimes I found this when I was demoing yesterday. I was on the Microsoft network. This will probably hit us. 
I found that the WebSocket traffic, for whatever reason, because sometimes WebSockets has trouble crossing different, when there's proxies and other kinds of stuff, there's known issues, it needs to fall back. Um, I don't know how to yet, there must be a way with Pusher to configure it to fall back. I don't think it does it automatically. Um, so what was happening was I was able to use the console to tell me, hey, my app really is sending the messages. They're just not making it to the browser. So this is really easy to wire up. Um, so what we do is uh, we require pusher. Assuming it's already been configured, which it has been. So wait a minute, that's the wrong thing. And then what we have is um, when you call request.execute, you can actually have it run some code after that. I know I just whack the user ID, so I'll put that back. I need to fix that actually, because so item dot user equals user dot user ID. So I can actually pass in a callback. Now this is a little interesting. This is part of, we optimize towards the conventional JavaScript convention here. If you're using node modules, you have to use the standard node convention of callbacks because it's a node module. But, but one of the things we tried to do with Azure Mobile Services is we were trying to appeal to the client side developer is we said, hey, they're already familiar like jQuery and a bunch of other frameworks use this syntax of pass an object with properties on it. So that's what we've got here. So when I call execute, if I want to, I can pass it an object with a callback. And I can say that, hey, after this has successfully um, committed to the database, like no problems happened, immediately respond to the client so that we're not holding them up, and then do a publish through pusher. Now, the publish function is not there yet, so I'm going to add it. Doesn't it like? You mean the outside, you're still inside that function, insert. Yeah, I think that's okay. I think, but maybe not. I think you can have nested functions. But. So what I've done here is I've entered my pusher information that it gives me, and I'm telling it that I want to push on the to-do updates channel. And this is the event. And I'm passing it. Yeah, no, it, it should be able to get it embedded because it, it should have item available. I don't know why it did that, but let, let's try one more time. So that was, yeah, OK. So that should work. Now it has access to the item ID and it's saying item created. So let's save that. Now if this doesn't work, then it means that what I thought was the firewall is actually not the case and it was a bug. Um, so then the last part is what I need to do on the client. So I'm going to embed pushers SDK. Did control C instead of control V. You ever do that? Yeah. It's annoying when that happens. Like, oh man. You mean Apple C? Yeah, Apple C. Oh. Yes, that's what I meant. <laughs> okay. Why is 
do a new grab. All right. So we've got that. Now we've got one more thing, which is to actually bind to pusher. And I have it showing an alert when it gets it. This is what was not working last night. And if it doesn't work now, then it means there's a bug. If it works now, then I know for sure it was related to the firewall issues. Okay. So this is uh, the way that you set up Pusher, and Pusher has a subscribe, and then you can call bind, which allows you to bind to a function when a certain event happens. Pusher also has their own kind of, uh, I don't know if it's grunt or growl. They have a plugin um, that will pop up a nice window, so it looks like a native, like more of a native push notification. Um, I couldn't get that to work right, so I didn't use it. Um, but let's, let's see what happens now. So this, I think, was saved already, yeah. Did it break filtering? Or did I, did I create two items or one? There were two there when you hit refresh. So I had already created two with my username. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, but now it lost one. Wait, what happened there? That's weird. Uh, I don't think I did, but I think I broke something. But anyway, let's let's see what happens. There we go. So this was the network thing. And you can go here, and you can now see. Uh, let's do it again. I was I must have switched off. Let's try it one more time. That's great. Now I know for sure that I wasn't smoking something. I might have been, but oh. I should remove that stupid rule or make it 15. Okay, so item 9 created. There you go. I think that's it.